I want you to return to the Bible. This time, would you turn to Matthew with me? Chapter 1. This is actually an intro to the book of Matthew, so we're not going to be just looking at the first chapter today, but I, I want to introduce the Gospel of Matthew to you. You know, I read the Bible through, I don't know how many times I have, I've stopped counting, but the fact of the matter is, as you read the Bible through, you begin to see highlights certain things really stand out to you. And one of the things is that human beings are uniquely created by God and designed to be God's representative rulers on this earth. However, because of the fall, because of the entrance of sin into the human family, this rulership, human government, must I say, has failed miserably. Not only modern times, but ancient times. But God has promised, as I read the Word of God, that one day He is going to raise up the perfect ruler. We're first given an indication of that in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where that perfect ruler is called the seed of the woman. And this seed would come and one day undo the whole mess, would right all the wrongs, would rule with a character of righteousness that would bring peace to the entire earth. That's probably why the prophet calls him the Prince of Peace. This perfect ruler, this promised seed, Genesis tells us will come through Abraham's descendants. He would come specifically through the Jewish people, and the Jewish people will call him the Anointed One or the Messiah. He's referenced in the Jewish scriptures at least 330 times through the prophets. Well, guess what? Since that first reference in Genesis 3.15 to the present, thousands of years have gone by. And even from that prophecy to the writing of Matthew, thousands of years, the Jewish people have waited. Moses, David, Solomon, Hezekiah, a good king, but all of them disqualified themselves as rulers and because of the wicked leadership first of all in the northern kingdom of Israel and then secondly in the southern kingdom of Israel both of those kingdoms eventually were sacked and uh, the people were carried into exile but following the return from the Babylonian captivity as it was called eventually the rulers that uh, came to rule over that southern kingdom of Israel were corrupted again. And for about 400 years, God didn't say a word to the, to the nation of Israel. God finally breaks his silence to the Jewish people, and he does so through the Gospel of Matthew. And I don't say that Matthew was the first of the four Gospels that were written, but Matthew is distinctively the Gospel that was written specifically to the Jewish people. And that's why I say God breaks his silence by Matthew standing up and saying to the Jewish people, He's here! The Anointed One has arrived. Messiah's here. What an unlikely Jewish man, however, to be picked by the Holy Spirit to write the gospel to the Jews. Matthew was a tax collector. He worked for the Roman government, and so he was hated as a collaborator with the Romans. And yet, unconventional wisdom again, God picks this Jewish man to write this gospel. He has a surname. Sometimes he's called Levi or Levi, but his name is, is Matthew uh, that we are most familiar with. 
and he addresses his gospel specifically to the Jews. I think that the book of Matthew, though it's 28 chapters, can be outlined by noticing very carefully two, re uh, two repeated uh, recurring phrases. First time in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, from that time, and Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, from that time, Jesus. Those two repeated phrases give us the division for the book. And I want to outline the book for you this morning as an introduction to the Gospel of Matthew by having you, first of all, see what I call Messiah's entrance in the first four chapters. And then I want you to see Messiah's emphasis, or, or his efforts, rather, uh, beginning in the second half of chapter 4 and down through uh, chapter 16. Then halfway through chapter 16, the third part is Messiah's emphasis, which really is all about the end purpose, goal that he came to fulfill in his coming. He's here. We're going to see his entrance, his efforts, and his emphasis. Before we go any further, let's pause a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today that we can be here. We believe, Lord, that you have something for us from your blessed word. We believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God, nothing less than that. And thus it holds authority over not only what we say we believe, but how we live our lives. Lord, speak to us through it today. Speak to us and give us spiritual ears that are tuned in, that we might hear spiritual hearts that are open to what you have to say to us. This is the way that you communicate with people, especially. And so I pray, Lord, that we would be receptive. I thank you, Holy Spirit of God, blessed promised power of Pentecost, for your filling and your enabling, I take. And I thank you that you undertake for me. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's begin in the first chapter through really the 16th verse of chapter 4 and see Messiah's entrance into this world. And uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background. At the time when Jesus came, when he arrived to planet Earth, the Jewish people in that time period believed in really two separate anointed ones, two separate messiahs. They taught that there was, first of all, a messiah that would suffer like Joseph did. We just covered the life of Joseph in the book of Genesis. And then they said after that there would arise a second messiah who would conquer and reign like King David did. Well, they were longing not really for a Joseph-type Messiah. They were longing for a conquering King David-type anointed one. That's where their hearts were because they were under, uh, under the oppressive regime of the Roman Empire. So here comes Messiah. Messiah is here. Messiah Jesus arrives, and what the Jewish people, and perhaps the majority of them even to this day don't realize, is that Messiah Jesus, he is both anointed ones in one person. He's the suffering Messiah, and he is the sovereign Messiah. All wrapped up in the same person. However, also in two separate comings. His first coming, as Matthew records it here, his second coming that Matthew talks about in chapter 24 when he returns. Interesting. Let's look at his entrance here in his first coming as Matthew puts it together for us. 
I want you to note his origin. His origin is really talked about in the first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel. And what his origin is, is really his credentials proving that he is the Jewish Messiah. And the way in which his origin and his credentials are put forth in Matthew chapter 1 and 2 is first of all in the first 17 verses of chapter 1 you read about his ancestry the book opens the book of the generations of Jesus Messiah the son of David the son of Abraham his family tree is uh, brought forth because his family tree reveals that God's promise of the anointed one is now fulfilled in this person, through his stepfather David, or, or rather his stepfather Joseph, he is uh, put into David's line. And as a result of that, he has the legitimate right to the throne of Israel. Again, we'll look at to chapter 1 in more detail perhaps next week or the, the week after. There's also, regarding his origin in this first chapter, that which deals with his birth, his nativity. And uh, in verses 8 to 25, he is referred to as that virgin-born fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in his birth. In fact, in that first chapter, he quotes Isaiah's prophecy, <clears throat> and uh, he says that, uh, verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Quoting from Isaiah 7:14, that's his nativity. His origin also, uh, in chapter 2, is all about his identity. And uh, there are foreign diplomats. We call them wise men, right? The Magi. There are foreign diplomats that, uh, that recognize him as king, and uh, they come to worship him. And also in that second chapter, he is exiled by God supernaturally into the land of Egypt for safety because of Herod's desire to kill him. But you see in chapter 3 to chapter 4 his character. And there are two occasions in which his character uh, really identifies him. In chapter 3, there is the testifying that happens at his baptism. John the Baptist, he is called the prophet that prepares the way of the Lord. So this anointed one is the Lord. He prepares the way of the Lord. John the baptizer does that. And he prophesies about the anointed one, about Messiah. And then, when he is baptized of John in the Jordan River, he comes up out of that uh, water, having been immersed. And when he comes up out of the water, there is a voice from heaven. And there is the Holy Spirit taking the form of a, of a dove that uh, lands upon his head. And the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So there is that God-given declaration and that Holy Spirit designation that this anointed one is the Son of God. This is my beloved Son, God the Father says. There is also in his identity and his character in particular in chapter 4, it's seen in the testing in the wilderness or in the desert. The first, uh, uh, I think, 16 verses of Matthew 4 is his temptation there in the wilderness. And you, you, you have to remember that uh, he's the last Adam. That's what uh, the former rabbi Saul of Tarsus calls him. We know him as Paul the Apostle. He calls him the last Adam. You remember the first Adam? He was tempted to sin in a beautiful garden paradise. The last Adam, he faces temptation in a howling desert, wilderness, having not eaten for 40 days. 
And yet, as the representative man, he succeeds in not yielding to the temptations given to him directly by Satan, the devil. In fact, the Bible tells us through the writer of Hebrews that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And because of that, he's able to help us. He's able to, to keep us from yielding to temptation if we will depend upon him. So that's basically Messiah's entrance. Second point is this. Messiah's efforts, his efforts. We pick it up in chapter 4 and uh, look at verse 17. Here's the, the key word that, that uh, begins to concentrate all the energy of the, of the Spirit-anointed Messiah on his ministry to Israel. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So here he is. What are the Messiah's efforts? Number one, to preach. There's preaching. The longest message recorded in the Bible is in this section. It's called, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's his preaching, it's his teaching. Here he is announced as the long-awaited uh, uh, prophet of Israel who has come to set up his kingdom. He is the Messiah King. And what will be the laws that will govern his kingdom? I believe that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And really, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount and, and uh, think about what it is telling us, what Jesus is saying, in that, you know what he's saying? He's sim simply saying this. Observing the law is not merely doing external things, but it is a matter of the heart. It begins inwardly. You must have a heart change in order to properly respond to the Word of God, in order to fulfill the will of God, in order to please God. You can't do it just by going through outward external things. You must have a heart that has been regenerated, a heart that has been given God's life into it. When that happens, you become a new creation. But this is what his preaching really is talking about. That you, it starts with a, a heart change that instills in you that a heart love for God in which you seek him. And when you seek him, it causes all your worries and fears to melt away. And love for others flows out from you so that you begin to care about them more than you care about yourself and you minister to others, and you esteem others better than yourself. That's his preaching. So Messiah's efforts, first of all, involved preaching, but also beginning in chapter 8 and verse 1 and down through the end of chapter uh, uh, 12, there is the proofs. His efforts are not only preaching, but proofs. Proofs of what? Well, when he was come down from the mountain, chapter 8, verse 1, great multitudes followed him, and this is where the proofs begin. There is a series of miracles that he performs that demonstrates that he is the Messiah King, and he has all authority over both natural realm and the supernatural realm. He cures diseases, he casts out demons, and he even raises people out of death. Proofs that he is the long-awaited Messiah King. But they've already begun to reject his earthly kingdom that he is calling them to. In chapter 11, he pronounces woes against some key Galilean cities. Woe unto you, Bethsaida. Woe unto you, Chorazin. 
because they are already rejecting the king and his kingdom. And in chapter 12, he warns the Jewish leaders there that call him a demon worker. They say that you cast out demons by the power of Satan. And he really puts them in, his, in their place for that kind of blasphemy. This is all Messiah's efforts. Preach, and then proofs, and thirdly, then he begins to reveal his plans. In chapter 13 through chapter 16, at least the first chapter 13, you have a, a, a series of parables that reveal the rejection of the kingdom that he is saying is at hand it reveals the rejected kingdom in cryptic form and uh, and the kingdom of God is then presented in a present mysterious form that will form between Messiah's first coming and Messiah's second coming and it's uh, followed then in chapter 14 by a example of the Messiah's power to supply the need of his people. There's the feeding of the 5,000. And also in uh, chapter uh, 15, there is the demonstration of the anointed one's power to support his people. Or actually chapter 14 still where you remember he comes at night and he's walking on water on the Sea of Galilee. There's a storm. He's walking on water. The, the uh, disciples are on that boat and they're, they're striving to the best of their ability to get that boat from sinking and get it to shore in the midst of a storm. They're, they see Jesus. They're afraid. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you. He says, come. Peter steps out of that boat in the midst of a storm, and he begins to walk to Jesus. And what Jesus demonstrates is not only can I, the Messiah, supply your need, but I can, I can support your walk. I can support your life with me. I can, uh, I can help you. I can enable you. In chapter 15, there is the stress of a need for inward cleansing. You remember the disciples were, uh, were, uh, they were confronted by the Pharisees because they did not go through the ritual cleansing before they ate. And Jesus said, it's not the things that you put into your mouth, the food that you consume that defiles you. It's what comes out of your heart that really defiles. And so he's showing the need for inward cleansing. Again, he's, he's putting forth his plan. This is what he's about. He's about inward cleansing. He's about supplying and, su and supporting his people and cleansing the hearts of people. And, uh, and he also, uh, remember, he shows them the need that they have for him to deliver them. In chapter 16, uh, he says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? Who do you think I am? Who do others say I am? Peter is given God-given insight, and he says, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And there's that wonderful insight that uh, is given at that time. And that's when this section ends. Because in chapter 16, if you'll turn with me there, and uh, look with me at verse 21, it says, from that time forth, there's that phrase, the second occurrence of it, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Here is the final section in the book of Matthew. And it is really Messiah's emphasis. And what is his emphasis? Well, again, he focuses 
to change, uh, uh, he focuses his change to prepare his followers for his eventual departure, his upcoming departure. And here's the procedure that he takes here, beginning in that 21st verse. He basically tells them this. Perhaps you haven't gotten this, but there is a cross before there is a crown. There is suffering before there is sovereignty. I'm going to go to the cross before I'm ever going to sit on a throne. This is his his emphasis. This is the procedure that's going to take place. First, he, uh, the first reference he tells us in that 21st verse of chapter 16 that he ever made to his disciples about his crucifixion. But he also quickly tells them that the crucifixion, his death, will be followed by resurrection. And we know that that resurrection will lead to him being transfigured and in chapter 17, there's a preview of the kingdom. He's transfigured before three of his disciples who are in awe. But he reveals to his disciples that, uh, and by the way, they're going to be the nucleus of the coming church, right? He reveals to them the procedure that is going to follow. And by following the parable of the king, you really enter, he enters into Jerusalem. He judges Israel at the temple, you remember, in chapter 21. Uh, he overturns those tables. And then in chapter 23, he pronounces woes upon the city of Jerusalem. And he laments as he thinks. This is the procedure that he's going to take. And this is his emphasis in the latter part of his, of his uh, three and a half year ministry. It's going to be suffering before there's going to be glory. And then in chapter 24 and 25, he talks about the future, the glorious future. But before there can be a glorious future, again, he says in chapter 24, there is coming a greater holocaust in Israel, in the very geographic location of Israel itself, not in Europe. There is coming the greatest holocaust that the people of Israel ever have or will suffer. That's what Matthew 24 tells us. It's going to be a day of terrible judgment and purging of Israel and in the entire earth. However, out of that, God will save a remnant of Jewish people who will inherit and enter the kingdom with Messiah Jesus as the king. That's the future. And then Messiah's emphasis also in verses in chapter 26 to 28 is really all about his departure. So his procedures, his future, and the departure. And really this is the basis, what, we're, what, what he says here and what happens here in, in chapter 26 and following is the basis for all the kingdom blessings that Messiah Jesus will bring. And really, what he says here is, I am the mediator. I am the mediator. I'm going to suffer. And uh, in chapter 26 and 27, he suffers. He's crucified, the Messiah is crucified, fulfilling the prophecies of the Jewish scriptures. He suffers a, a horrible piercing. And uh, after that, he rises from the dead three days later. He, Forty days later, he ascends to heaven. He's enthroned on the right hand of God. He is now the king wielding supreme authority. He is fulfilling Psalm 2 in which thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen, the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. And that's what's happening and that's what will happen. He's building his kingdom right now. It's in that spiritual phase at this point. He's building his kingdom and it is stretching to the uttermost part of the earth. 
the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, he told the disciples. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And that's what's happening. And that's what has happened. He will return to establish his promised messianic kingdom. In the early years of the 1800s, was very troubled times for the German Confederation. There were rumors of revolution and rioting had the federated government in panic. And the chief statesman, Clemens von Metterer of the Confederation, he ordered thousands of young men to be drafted in the army to guard the borders and to put down internal revolts. And across the countryside, young German men were given uniform and they, they tramped off to unknown places. In one German village, there was a beautiful old stone-walled church with an ornately carved uh, facade, beautiful stained glass, and there was a, a stately pipe organ in that church. The organ was famous throughout the region for its beauty and its tone. And one day, the elderly caretaker of the church was interrupted during his chores by a knock at, at the door of the sanctuary, and he opened it, found a young man in uniform standing there on the steps. And the young man said, Sir, I have a favor to ask, young soldier. Would you please permit me to play the organ for one hour? Well, I, I'm sorry, young man, the caretaker replied. No one but our own organist is permitted to play the organ, but sir, I've heard so much about the organ of this church and I've walked so many miles just to see it, just to play it for a single hour. The elderly man paused and he shook his head sadly. Well, please, the soldier pleaded. My commander gave me 24 hours leave and in a few days, another province uh, where I will be fighting uh, is expecting me to return. This may be my last chance in my life to ever play this organ. Well, the caretaker reluctantly let him in, and uh, he took a key from his pocket. He held it out to the soldier. The organ's locked, he said, here's the key. The soldier took the key, he unlocked the ornate cabinet of this organ, and he began to play. Just a billow of majestic chords rolled from that beautiful organ, the golden pipes of that organ. And the caretaker, he just stood there amazed as this music washed over him and it actually moved him to tears. And he sat down in one of the pews and, and just was entranced by the beauty of the music. Within minutes, people from the village gathered at the church doorway and they they were looking in and they removed their hats and the villagers stepped into the sanctuary they sat down to listen streams of beautiful music just filled the sanctuary for one hour and then the gifted fingers of the organist struck a final chord from the keyboard lifted his fingers he closed and locked the keyboard cabinet and as he stood and turned he was surprised to see the church was nearly filled with with parishioners who had laid aside their chores in order to listen to the beautiful music. Humbly receiving their compliments, the young soldier walked down the center aisle to return the key to the caretaker. Thank you, the young man breathed. The old man rose to his feet, he took the key and he said, no, thank you, grasping the soldier's gifted hands. He said, young man, that was the most beautiful music that these old ears have ever heard. What is your name, by the way? Well, my name is Felix. Felix Mendelssohn. The old caretaker's eyes widened as he realized whose hands he grasped, the hands of the young man who, before he was 20, had become one of the most celebrated composers on the European continent. The old man's gaze followed the young man as he left the church and disappeared into the village street and he thought to himself 
the master was here and I almost failed to give him the key. Messiah is here. Don't fail to give him the key. The Messiah is here and he's the master and he has the key and he has the ability to make your life have purpose and beauty and power and accomplish the very reason for which you exist. Give him the key and let him be your king. Let him be your Messiah. Reminds me of a song that we'll close with. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn crown brow. Lead me to Calvary. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you today that the Messiah is here. He's come, and he is here in the person of his Spirit. I do pray this morning that if there be anyone personally that has never opened their heart's door to the Lord Jesus, that they would see who he is and that they would welcome him in, that they would give him entrance, they would hand over to him the key of their heart, and they would invite him in to be their Messiah, their Savior from sin. Those of us that are born again, if we have locked the door, like is pictured in Scripture where Jesus is outside the door knocking and asking entrance, Lord, may we hand over the key to you, even your own people, hand over the key that you might be Lord of our lives, that you might be king of our hearts, that you might be king of our lives. May we surrender, may we yield to you this very moment, this very time. May we not allow it to pass without giving you the key to our, our entire life so that you can have your way with us. For as we've read this morning already, it is God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We want that. I pray we want that. I pray that that would be a handing over today of the key of our heart and our life to the King. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing this closing number, if there is something that the Holy Spirit of God is dealing with you about, maybe you need to swing your, the door of your heart open and invite him in for the first time as your Savior. Or maybe you're saved, but you've barred the Lord from certain areas of your life. Own him as king of your life. Open yourself fully to him today and to his kingship and lordship over you.